bad. Good. Welcome, everyone, to Season 3, Episode 111 of the Premiere Pod. I'm your host, Yosh Bika, joined by my co-host, Tyler Chan. In this episode, we got a pretty exciting one. I know we were off last week, international break, but the Premier League is finally coming back. It felt like an eternity because in this crazy, congested season, we haven't had an international break since September or literally since the season started. It's been such a long time. But mm-hmm. some big news that came out um, was the U.S. men's national team failing to qualify for another Olympic Games. But um, what also came out yesterday was Sergio Aguero announcing that he will be leaving Manchester City after the end of this season. And I guess before we get into that, I forgot to introduce Tyler. Tyler, how are you doing? I know you went on a, good. Uh, he went on a nice little short little vacation to get recharged. Um, always important to do that. So it's good that he is uh, he's back, recharged. Oddly enough, wearing a Germany jersey, even though they got upset by North Macedonia today, uh, 2-1. But um, Tyler's always been a Germany OG, Marco Royce, mm-hmm. Mesut Ozil, um, and so on. So I'm glad he's doing good. But major news, Sergio Aguero announcing that he's leaving Manchester City. It was, I guess, coming. I think we've all kind of been talking about like, hey, when is Aguero going to leave? But Aguero finally announced that he's leaving. There's no confirmation yet on which club he's actually going to be signing towards um, for, I guess, his new club. There's talks about maybe PSG and such looking to get him. There was also talks about him maybe returning to Argentina. That's maybe a discussion for another episode, but we wanted to kind of take this time to reflect on the career Sergio Aguero had in the Premier League. And I think, I guess the first question to start it off is your favorite moment of uh, Sergio Aguero. I think we all kind of know what it is, is the Aguero, like winning it for QPR. But I, I guess I'll make it a little bit difficult. If you had to pick one other moment besides that, I think for me, I think it would have to be him scoring six against Newcastle. I mean, that's insane. Like, I, I don't think of too many players that can score six goals against one team in like literally one, uh, one game. And to me, like that was one of those games where I just watched and I was like, holy crap, he actually scored six goals. Um, and I think I remember it too, because I think at that point I was taking my ACT and I had to turn my phone off. And then when I, when I turned my phone back on, I was like, what city six nil over Newcastle? I'm like, what happened? And it was like Aguero, 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 Aguero. So for me, it has to be the, uh, the six goals he scored against Newcastle. Oh my, (laughs) I, I, I would, I would have said the Aguero, (laughs) you know, QPR incident where he, I mean, that's like the game winner. That's essentially probably one of top five Premier, or probably most iconic Premier League moment of like the entire Premier League history. Yeah, I know it's literally it ruined Manchester United. I know, and like the, the look on Alex Ferguson's face. Like, I didn't really do justice. Phil Jones. <laughs> there was a face. There was a snapshot of Phil Jones looking all surprised with his shirt off. Dude, it was. I I remember. I think man, man, you were facing Sunderland. Yeah, and then like they won that easily. And then they're just watching the jumbo trying. I was like, all right, well, they're, you know, Man City are tied 2 2 against QPR. We got this. And they're already like kind of already celebrating. Like they're already all mm-hmm. set. And then what do you know? Like in the last minute, you can see the Alex Ferguson just turn around like, what? <laughs> and then you hear the, I'm going to say it again, Aguero. There we go. <laughs> That's way better. And then a Balotelli's one assist he probably ever had in his career sets up Aguero and gets the game winner. And, you know, Aguero rips off the shirt. It was a very iconic moment. I remember that exact moment. I was eating McDonald's like <laughs> on, on like a Sunday morning or like Saturday morning. I think it was, no, it was championship Sunday. So it had to be on Sunday morning. And I look up and I still didn't really understand what was really happening. I was just like, did that? Wow. <laughs> like Man City <laughs> finally won. It's like they actually did it. It was incredible because like you, you're kind of all cheering for at that time, Man City being the underdog to like kind of finally take down the giant which is man you <laughs> they're you know their next door neighbor their brother and they finally did it so like that was the noisy very neighbors. big iconic yeah i was like i'll never forget that and the meal <laughs> so i was like holy cow it's but funny that, me, that moment get, is like mm-hmm. tied to mcdonald's <laughs> I, I ate a lot of mcdonald's growing up so there's there's a lot of memories tied to mcdonald's shout out to mcdonald's not a sponsor but if they want to sponsor us uh, hit us up but my other favorite moment it's kind of weird because, like, I really respect Aguero. I really like him as a player. But 
every time I see him face Liverpool, he scores against us every single time. Yeah, every time he plays United, he always scores too. I'm like, he's always there for big games. Like, he's always there, either getting like a crucial penalty or I remember one distinct game. I forgot. It's the years escaping me, but he literally scored a long shot against Liverpool and just like ruined us. And I don't know why that's like my favorite Aguero moment, but that goal just kind of summed up who he was. Like it didn't matter who he was facing yeah. or like what the moment or the event entailed. It was just like he was always so clinical. Like he was literally Mr. Reliable, except for the injuries. But like when he when he was on the pitch, like he was yeah. really good. And he he was not like the most physically gifted player. Like he's like five eight, pretty fast back in the day. He's like a little chunkier now, but like he just he had didn't such good look, control of the ball. Yeah, he had really good control. Like he didn't really juke that many players either. He just kind of played it more simple. It's just really like he's literally just the epitome of clinical. Like he just managed to always get the shot off and he'd always be able to put it in the right spot with the right amount of power. And that like finesse shot from the top of the box against Liverpool, like that was like, geez, that was a favorite moment for me also because I was like, I really hope Liverpool gets someone like him one day. Like I was, <laughs> like, I was jealous. I was like, this guy's crazy. They got Suarez. They got Suarez. And I was like, oh, hope we don't lose him. And then, you know, we <laughs> lost him. But, you know, ultimately it all ended well for that. But mm-hmm. Aguero, I'll, I'm always going to consider him like a legend. Yeah. Like for Man City, for like the era of the Premier League that I watched and started with, like he was just always there. Mm-hmm. Like coming from Atletico Madrid and then coming straight into the Man City side and being like the main man, he always had that edge about him. It's like, all right, he's like one of the top strikers in the Premier League. Yeah. And like he's always wanted. He's not always like, you know, wanted in FIFA, but <laughs> at least in real life, he was like one of the top. Oh, yeah. There, were, there was a story that apparently um, Manchester United were really wanting to sign him. Like Sir Alex Ferguson really wanted to sign Aguero um, from Atletico Madrid because I think the same year David De Gea came to United was the same year they same year city purchased aguero and i think ferguson wanted really wanted um aguero as well but i think like the board and such just didn't like couldn't find like the right pi- price for him and such but um man that's like one of those once in a generational like type of strikers that just so good and for me um i guess since i got into the premier league uh, obviously a little bit later on than tyler like my first season like full season of watching it was 2014 15 season um what I remember most is that when Pep Guardiola came in, Sergio Aguero was kind of getting like the first season Pep Guardiola was there. Gabriel Jesus came in during the January transfer window. But I remember when he came in, he was like replacing Aguero. And then the whole talk was like, oh, man, Aguero is going to get replaced. And um, a lot of the conversation was because he doesn't fit Pep style of play where Pep is more focused on the striker being able to play with everyone and, you know, um, connecting, linking up with everyone and Aguero was always just like that really brutal, lethal striker that will finish anything. And we've seen that with Pep Guardiola, like Zlatan Ibrahimovic and such, that if you don't follow his game plan, he will phase you out and like transfer you out. He doesn't care how good of a player you are. If you don't follow his system, he will um, phase you out. But I have to give a lot of props to Aguero because he did learn from that. And literally from um, after that first season, those next two seasons... I would say he was probably one of their most crucial players along with Vincent company and such because he was such a brutal, lethal striker where he just finished all of his chances. And as he got older, his game started to evolve too, where he couldn't just rely on like, you know, like Tyler said, he wasn't like the most paciest and such, but um, his game overall, all around game just got a lot better. He became more lethal, but obviously as he got a little bit older, the injury started piling up. But um, that's what I, I'll remember Aguero too, just like the, the crazy finishes and the crazy amount of goals he scored, but also um, the way he kind of evolved his game to fit like Pep Guardiola and ma- made him a better player, but also allowed him to stay on uh, Manchester City uh, much longer and such. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's sign of a really good player when you can adapt your game um, even at a later stage in your career. That's kind of why I always kind of said when I was growing up, when the Messi Ronaldo kind of competition was always ongoing at the very early stages like when Messi Ronaldo in like their early 20s mid 20s when I started watching them you know it was always Messi was always like on top it was like a lot of people would argue like oh it's Ronaldo because he's like it's more fun to watch I was like I don't know like Messi he's super fast too like he his dribbling is insane but I feel like as they got older like Messi didn't 
he couldn't rely on the pace as much. And then it really kind of dipped down and he became more of like a midfield you know, creator kind of things like that. Mm -hmm. But for Ronaldo, he also adapted his game. He became more of, you know, like a clinical finisher. He's just in the right spot at the right times rather than just running through and trying to skill out three teams (laughs) or like three teams worth of players from the crowd and then back in and then score. Like he got more smarter, more mature. And for Aguero, he's like that kind of person. It's a little scary that he's about to turn 33, but he's already facing so many injuries. I'm like, man. I mean, that's not that far away from us. <laughs> it's like nine years. <laughs> Maybe he's already like kind of like glass. So hopefully uh, it's not a, you know, a prediction of what yeah. happens to everyone else. But, you know, but for Aguero, he definitely did have to adapt his game too. And he kind of went more towards like the Ronaldo side where, you know, as he got older, as, you know, more competition came in with Gabriel Jesus coming in and also Pep Guardiola trying to phase him out and then him just turning up and saying, nope, pulling like an Aaron Rodgers and just having like MVP seasons. <laughs> like after he's trying to get phased out, like it's, it just goes to show that he actually is a true legend. Like when you think of Man City, yeah, I always think of like certain players like, you know, David Silva, Vincent company, and then always Aguero too. Like who's, who's their, who's their strikers? Like usually it's Aguero or Jekko. Yeah. Like that's who I usually think about. Oh wow. Yeah. Jekko. Jekko. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's an old one. I, I was going to mention mm-hmm. that, with uh with the Guerrero leaving, it's the end of an era at Manchester City, like the the first, I guess, era of like championship success, um, which includes the likes of Sergio Guerrero, David Silva, Vincent Company, Yaya Torre, Pablo Zabaleta. Um, you could like chuck Joe Hart in there too. Um like when you think, I guess when people will look back on this era of Manchester City. Um, they will think of like these core of players that set the foundation for what Pep Guardiola and company have now with the likes of Kevin De Bruyne, Gundogan, uh, Mares, Phil Foden and such. Like these guys set the foundation for what is success at City. And they actually are making a statue, um, I guess, outside the Etihad of Vincent Company, David Silva and Sergio Aguero um, now that Aguero is leaving. So, um, Yeah. I mean, these guys are going to go down like for history books as city legends. And, you know, I guess when you take a tour of the Etihad Stadium, like they're going to be achievements and a posters of all these guys and all the accolades they earned at their time at City. Mm-hmm. They really set the standard. And as as much as we make fun of City fans for majority of them being kind of bandwagon, like <laughs> their history, you know, there was history of obviously of like them being created, you know, years and years ago and them playing up to the Premier League, things like that. But I would say their most successful time in history is now. Yeah. And it's with Aguero. It's with, you know, Yaya Torre, company, all those players. And, you know, that it's it's kind of crazy to think about. It's like they're all getting a, a statue, but it makes sense. Like these are literally the people who set the foundations for what standards are required at city mm-hmm. because like I, like the people that replaced or like the players that replaced them they have a lot to live up to and that's why a lot of people were saying is like gabriel jesus can't do it like it's yeah. literally he's not aguero like aguero he needs to be like he needs to be a player that can come off a bench like aguero usually not on the bench but like if aguero did come off the bench you kind of guaranteed a goal yeah like you always just think about it. it's like oh yeah he's gonna get a goal like it's not even a question so like these players setting those kind of standards is like huge. And that's something that'll probably live on for a while as long as they have oil money and Pep Guardiola, things like that. But <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I I think it's really interesting. I, I wanted to I guess when he did announce that he was leaving, the conversation did turn into is he the greatest striker of Premier League history or like is he in the top five? And I wanted to point that question out to us. Um, if we had to rank our top five strikers in the Premier League history. So I guess I can start. Um, and so my list is going to compile just like off like knowledge that I've read about and seen and stuff I've seen and just read about. So for me, I think like the, oh gosh, this is tough. This is really hard. But I, I would, if I have to go number one, I think you have to go Alan Scherer because he's like the king of mm-hmm. goals. I mean, like literally Most all goals. time Premier League goal score. Like he's like the king of goals for England um, for the Premier League. But I think for number two, um, I'd probably pick Thierry Henry because, um, you know... The Invincibles. Yeah, Invincibles. But, you know, 
obviously I didn't get a chance to watch him live and such because I didn't get into the soccer. I got into the soccer scene a lot later, but just watching highlights of what this guy was able to do. I mean, it was insane. I think the goal he scored against Liverpool, like back in 02 or early 2000s, where he just ran through the defense and just literally at the end, juked out a Liverpool defender and got the ball onto his right foot and just did a simple little finesse like bottom in the bottom corner. Um, and then the goal he, go- he scored against United where the ball came to him and he just like kind of like, like um, I would say like lifted it up and then just turned around and like volleyed it into the goal. Um, just like stuff like that. The pace he had, the skill he had was just immaculate. So for me, he's number two. Um, but I think Aguero... Um, would have to be either in like the three, three or four range, and then I'd probably put Eric Cantona in um, in there as well into the top five. And then, gosh, for like the fifth spot, there's so many to pick from. Like that, that's a hard one. Like I think Harry Kane is making a name for himself right now, but I guess since he's not retired, I guess I can't, I won't throw him in there right now. But um, maybe, gosh, there's so many. Like you could like pick Torres from his Liverpool years. You could pick. Um, Drogba. Yeah, you could pick Drogba. Suarez. You could pick Van Percy. Um, Rooney. Yeah, Rooney. Rooney's a tough one because he is a striker, but he's also not a striker. He like shifted back. <laughs> yeah, he's like one of those pseudo weird ones. So um, I guess for me, I have my top four. Like, I, There's just so many good, like great Premier League strikers to choose from. But if I had to pick four, like that's that's my top four. So it'd be would- Alan Scherer, Henri, um, Aguero, and then Cantona, Eric Cantona. I was, my first two are the same as your first two. Let's go. Alan Shearer and Thierry Henry. I kind of, like, there's there's a bit where you can think about the accolades they've had and, you know, the goals per game ratio, all the stats, things like that. But mm-hmm. also, I'm a little bit more recency biased since I really started watching around 2010. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I started with, like, Torres on the Liverpool and seeing Suarez come in and being so disruptive. So I actually put Suarez in my top five as well. Dang. I put him right at five. Okay. Suarez there. And then Aguero, I actually put a four. Okay. And I think it's just because he's been there longer. He's been such a key cornerstone of that Man City squad that's gotten so many. Like they gotten four Premier League titles and he's gotten the Golden Boot once. He's gotten seven Player of the Month awards. And also... The fact that he has like a ratio of like goals per match, I think it's like 0.67, where it's basically like every other game he scores and he's played like th- over 380 matches at this point. It's it's insane. Like he has 200, like 80 goals in 350, ma- like 380 matches. It's yeah, crazy. It's pretty insane when you look at like the conversion rate. And then he also um, is the third fastest player to reach 100 goals um, in like the sh- shortest appearances. So the only people ahead of him is Harry Kane. Uh, Oddly enough, Harry Kane and Alan Scherer, and right below Aguero is Thierry Henry, um, and right before and right after Thierry Henry is Ian Wright. So um, Aguero is also there, and I think he has tied Alan Scherer with the most amount of hat tricks in the Premier League with like eleven. Is it tied for a, with either it's eleven hat tricks or twelve hat tricks? Is one of those numbers, but I believe he has tied Alan Scherer with that number, and he could break it because he still got the rest of the season to go. I mean, it's going to be mm-hmm. tough, but um, I mean he. Like if you're looking at record books, like he's pretty much is like on the record for like anything striking related for the Premier League, whether it's goals, um, conversion rates, most fastest to 100 goals and such. Like uh, it's insane. And I think what also is insane too is that in his first year, he kind of scored. I think he scored what like 20 plus goals his first season, or or something oh, like that. Um, I think. So. I mean, if he's healthy the whole season, he'll for sure yeah. score 20 goals. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but he scored the winning goal, and it's it's crazy too because all the all the time we see is that when players come into the Premier League um, from another league, they struggle a lot. And for him to step up in that moment to score that winning goal and to just be this productive of a player is pretty phenomenal. Yeah, in this first season, 23 goals yeah. in the Premier League. In his first, so. that's crazy. Like you don't. That's not very normal for a player to come in, especially in season one, to do that. Do that type of thing. Unless you're like world class, so I mean, he basically summed up that he's world class in that uh, in that conversion rate. So, man, Guerrero is something else. That's the standard, man. Yeah. And random thing, but like to finish my list for number three, I'd, I'd, I actually would put Rooney. Like it's just oh nice. It's just so iconic. So I'm just yeah. Have to slap that in there. So there's my top five. But I don't know. I didn't put Cantona in there. I didn't put you know certain other players, but. That's just my own personal list. Like, man, Percy is very close to getting in, but 
Yeah. I actually, I, I was like, like just like looking at the Premier League. I like to just look at the Premier League website and look at the history books, like stats and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. It was crazy. I didn't know Van Persie won the golden boot with Arsenal his last year at Arsenal, then won the gold boot again with, I know he won the golden boot with United, but I didn't know he won it the year before with Arsenal. So that's pretty cool that he went back to back golden boots with two different teams. That was, I remember that was very controversial because he was just like, yeah, I am going to man- move to like Man U to win trophies. And then he did it. <laughs> and then I think they won. So yeah, they literally won the first <laughs> season he was there. Um, Gosh, I think so. Because I remember very distinctly, I'm not going to say the name, but there's a very big Man U fan back in my high school. And I believe that season they had like the blue and black striped away kits. Yeah. And that was like his first season there. And then that person bought like one of those jerseys that says like champions 19 on the back because they're like, oh, yeah, it's like we finally beat Liverpool for like most Premier League titles. I'm like, all right. <laughs> All right. And, uh, that's been like our last one. We haven't won. They haven't won another one. Like Manchester and I have not won another one since that, since that year. So, so I guess that Jersey is both a curse and I guess a reminder. You finally did it, but at what cost? <laughs> well, you know, back to Aguero, we're back to Aguero kind of just celebrating and honoring him. And it's kind of sad. I will say during this last season, he's here that he's, he's going to be riding the bench. Yeah. He's, he's been, been injured, injured, but also like, He's on the bench right now. Yeah. And you would think that a player of this caliber, you would try to put him in whenever he's good to go. Yeah. Like he should be a player you don't really even have a second guess about. It's like, all right, he's always going to be on the starting lineup sheet. Yeah. And and you've seen Pep Guardiola even have false nines. It's like, all right, we're going to put Phil Foden up top. I know. It's like, all right, you have Aguero. Yeah. Like he's he's fine now. It's like, just what? what, what? <sighs> I, no, I, really hope, him. I really him. hope he can uh, play more because. I w- it would be really cool to see him break that um, hat trick record, but yeah, it is pretty sad that he's also been injured a lot this season. He's not getting that like that nice swan song ending, I would say, like mm-hmm. other athletes you see from other major major professional sports when they're announcing their retirement. You know, like a Derek Jeter, um, like type Kobe. thing. Yeah, Kobe um, and such, where they kind of get like that nice final swan song. But I guess since he's not retiring, he's just leaving the team. But yeah, it's a uh, it's, it's kinda- pretty pretty crazy. Um, I still feel like he'll get like a big goodbye despite not having the fans in the stadium. Mm-hmm. Like I think because like once like, you know, Gerard left the team, it was it was very big. Once Lampard left Chelsea, it was really big. So, I mean, I think we'll see, you know, Aguero get something similar to that. But it's 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 going to be rough because now it's like he also has to start thinking. It's, it's, it's you know, you don't really want to think about this too soon, but. You always have to have that thought in the back of your head. It's like when something goes, something has to replace it. Yeah. You know, it's like when you have a friend, it's like, oh, man, sorry about your pet. Are you going to get a new one, though? <laughs> it's like, or it's like, oh, I'm sorry about, you know, your car. It's, you know, there's a rough accident. It's like, are you going to get a new car, though? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, you know, it's always like, what's what's new? And mm-hmm. do you feel like Jesus is the new or like the, the true replacement? No, I personally don't think so. I think we've had this conversation. We've had, we've talked about Jesus so many times during this podcast, mm-hmm. like series. And we were just like, every time we bring him up, it's like, yeah, I don't think this guy's the guy. And then he'll have like two games of like, okay, he's scoring some goals. And then he's just like, nah, he's not it. And for me, he has not done enough to convince me that he is the person. And that's why they've been linked to a lot of other strikers. And one of them is probably the hottest striker on the market right now in Europe is Erling Holland. And this guy's a goal machine. Norwegian I think we all know who he is this guy is like like what I'm watching this guy is so clinical one of the most clinical strikers I've seen at such a young age too it's amazing how good he is and it will be really soul crushing if if he either goes to Chelsea or Man City because I'm just like they don't need him like they they just don't they, they already have all these good players they, they don't need him like go to Real Madrid or Barcelona just stay away from the Premier League if you're not coming to Manchester United I will say that about Erling Holland. I do not want Erling Holland at Man City. That is that'd be a cheat code. That'd just be not fair. I know that would be a cheat code. And also, I don't know. I don't really see Holland as like a Man City player. Like this is too pass oriented for Holland. Dude, like he's just Holland very, just likes running like a train, like a freight train. Yeah, he's yeah. just 
he's <laughs> he's a pure finisher like if this was like connect the dots he's always going to be like the last dot that just finishes whatever he, he, happens whenever i like i sidetrack but whenever i do watch him all of his finishes they're so violent like he just like yeah. <laughs> makes it known that he like scored like they're just like straight up rockets into the back of the net it it is very vicious. It's like when you go to the park and you just play like the varsity kids that just <laughs> shoot all day. They're just so pent up and angry. It's like, all right, we're trying to put a hole in the net. It's like relax. But I mean, that's literally Holland. Like every finish is so clinical and so clean. Like that's the thing. It's like it's ferocious, but it's like so clean at the same time. It's like the ball just cuts the air like butter. Yeah. And then it's like, ooh. It, like it's so nice to see. It's like so simple at times too. And then you try to do it in real life. And you're like, what the heck? How do you do that? You realize he's like a six foot four buff boy. So, I mean, I personally, I always say my favorite players, I want him to go to like Liverpool, but I don't even know if he's like a true like Liverpool fit too. Like, it's just what team would best fit him. I don't know. Like, I, I wouldn't even be surprised if he would go. Oh, no, he should not go to Bayern Munich. No. <laughs> Lewandowski replacement right there. Yeah, Lewandowski replacement. I don't know. It'd be cool to see Holland at like, you know, Real Madrid or Barcelona too. But obviously, you know, Benzema still there at Real Madrid and Barcelona literally at negative $1 trillion. So. Yeah, they, they would not have the right amount of funds to get him. But for me, at least, if he's there, at least for me, it's like, okay, at least he's not at one of the other rival Premier League teams. I can be yeah. happy about that. Well, I mean... A lot of people are also speculating that some players might be leaving Tottenham. Yeah. And Kane has been on the list for possibly coming to Man City too. Because, you know, That'd he's not so winning funny. much at Tottenham. That would literally be so funny if he actually joins Man City. Like, think about you're literally leaving to go win trophies at Manchester City. Who would have said that sentence? Like, that's just, it, it's just, it's just really funny. It's just really Honestly, funny. if you're coming from Tottenham, it's not too surprising. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he'll be like the next Kyle Walker, left, left City. That's I left true. Tottenham to go to City. Um, and then Kyle Walker won trophies. True. Uh, so, and uh, the I, one the thing about Hyun Min Son is that he's been linked to Bayern Munich, which is crazy because, I mean, he would fit like a Bayern, Bayern Munich scheme, I would say, because he's definitely like ta- like talented enough and technical enough to be able to play Bayern way, like the Bayern way and such. But, oh man, that would be... That would just be a plethora of riches on the wings. They don't even need them. Yeah, they have like they Nabry, got Coleman, Sané. Sané, Nabry. Like, what more do they want? <laughs> <laughs> so, I think, uh, I mean, on the, on that same topic also, like, you know, Aguero, he might leave. Or, or no, obviously, he's going to leave. Mm-hmm. And I, I mentioned Barcelona. I heard the grapevines of just random internet rumors because, you know, rumors <laughs> on the internet are for sure, but... You know, since Barcelona don't have a transfer budget, Aguero's technically like a free agent. Yeah. So I could could just see that. And, and he has a, well, obviously Messi's the godfather. Yeah. And whether Messi Literally. leaves or not, it's kind of up in the air, but they do have a good relationship because obviously Argentinian, mm-hmm. Argentinian national team and everything. Um, so that's not too far off of Barcelona getting a striker for uh, uh, Aguero, getting Aguero as a yeah. striker. But I guess that's, that kind of wraps up the Aguero segment. I know we, we kind of talked about it a lot, but, you know, he left a big legacy in the Premier League, so it's worth talking about for a while. And uh, I guess switching topics to, I guess, more of a somber tone, uh, somber, more angry tone, is the U.S. men's national team under 23 um, were in Olympic qualifying this past uh, week, um, past two weeks, actually, for the during the international break. And they needed to win their group to get into to qualify for the olympics they need to finish top two in the group to um get to qualify for the olympics and they failed to do that um they won their first two games and then they lost to mexico and then they lost to honduras um but this will be the third time third straight olympic run that the u.s men's national team will have failed to qualify and if you didn't know um fifa or i guess yeah fifa set the rule that anyone born um Anyone before anyone born after 1997 is eligible, so like 98, 99, 2000. So a lot of the U.S. men's national team, a lot of the star players are actually under 23. You know, like they're born in like 97, 98, 99, um, and such. So a lot of them would be eligible, but the problem would have been would the clubs allow them to go on to the Olympic Games? And I know um, Christian Pulisic and Yunus Musa Musa uh, made it known that they want to compete in the Olympics, that they wanted to represent usa in the olympics so um it was a big failure because 
not only is this the third straight Olympic trial run that they have failed to qualify for, they also failed to obviously qualify for the 2018 World Cup. And it's a big deal because one thing um, that is known is that when you qualify for these big tournaments, I guess like I play a big factor of like when you qualify for these tournaments, the players that get to play in them get a ton of international experience playing in like some of the biggest stages. And the fact that the U S is missing out on another Olympics means that they miss out on that extra month of training together, that extra uh, month of building camaraderie, building friendships, you know, getting used to each other, um, playing on bigger stages, getting used to that pressure. And if they're only competing for confederation cups and gold cups, that's not like a ton of pressure, you know? Um, yeah. You play like some good teams there, but you need to be playing at the world cup. You need to be playing for the Olympics to um, represent your nation in a bigger way. So that way you kind of get used to the pressure and also get used to playing um, some of these bigger teams, but also you have a chance of winning something. And then if you do go on a big run and win it, you can kind of carry that on the back of your shoulder being like, Hey, we, we did this, you know, we did it together. And it, you know, kind of gives you the confidence, confidence that you can take towards other big tournaments. But if you miss, if you keep missing out on them, you'll get that experience. And, you know, you're just kind of sitting at home watching TV instead of, you know, <laughs> you know playing in the Olympics and such. Always those memes of it's like you get kicked out of the Champions League. You just got to watch it on your TV now. But <laughs> it's the whole US right now. I was literally thinking, I know there's that rule or like the Olympics. It's always 23 and under. Yeah. And that's kind of sad because that means I don't qualify. I can't even get on the Olympics team now officially. <laughs> but I was also thinking, though, at the same time, I know the, the, the good players, the star players that are, are actually still younger than me, like, you know, Pulisic, Gio Reyna. I was like, where are they? I looked at the starting 11 for the team that face Honduras. And I was thinking, I don't know a single one of these players. Yeah, they're like all like, like MLS, MLS, like Youth Academy and like some from like Europe. But I th- that that was also the problem. I think um, they didn't, they just didn't bring them, um, which was weird. I, I don't know like the exact situation there. I think it was also the clubs didn't want them. Um there because mm-hmm. i think they had to get permission from the clubs to get them to be part of the uh the olympic because they also played more games in that run so there's also maybe a mm-hmm. chance of increased injury because i think the u.s only played two matches it was like northern ireland and jamaica but uh not northern ireland it was uh it was jamaica and no, i think, was I think it was northern, northern, northern ireland okay because um, i remember they played they're like oh the u.s men's national team played a friendly in one i was like a friendly <laughs> yeah I, was like, um, I thought we we're going for the Olympics. Yeah, and I and think then, that was the problem. They had to get permission from the clubs, and I think a lot of the clubs were like, "No, you can't do that." So, and it's frustrating because like the Olympics does matter. I guess Olympic soccer because we've seen some big names. Like I remember when Brazil won the gold medal in 2016, um, when they had Neymar, Gabriel Jesus. Like it, it was an insane team, and then Messi and Aguero actually won the Olympics too. Um, they won gold in the Olympics, so. Uh, Some big name players have won gold at the Olympics and they do perform. So it it was a big chance to perform at a big stage. And unfortunately, the U.S. fails once again to qualify for another big competition. I don't know. It's it's kind of annoying because, as you said, too, whenever the U.S. finally do make it into a world competition like the World Cup, for example, they're not going to have that experience on the back of their their heads where it's like, you know how when Liverpool made it to the Champions League final against Real Madrid the first time, mm-hmm. they didn't really have that experience of being in a Champions League final or even being in that many finals. And then that experience really, or lack of experience really kind of hit them. And then the following season when they had that experience, you know, they they kind of took Tottenham to town. But now every time this young US men's national team goes into another big competition, they're always going to have like that little kind of thought where it's like all right we don't really have that experience and also there's just more and more pressure growing where they just haven't won anything significant like there's so much potential in these players and they can't even qualify for the olympics or the world cup yeah and it's just going to keep building like this pressure just keeps on building and building and building yeah it's i it's feel like the, the amount Liverpool, of pressure like, title drought where it's just like when are they going to win the premier league title and it's just like yeah it's going to need something special like a special coach special players like I mean, they they everything. have. Um, I was talking to some people. I mean, like the 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 group, young group of players they have now is probably the best and most talented group of players they've had in oh, 
like their whole generation. I guess this is like the golden generation of U.S. players with Gio Reyna, Western McKinney, Christian Pulisic, um, Eunice Musa, um, you know, Serginio Des. Yeah, Serginio Des, Josh Sargent. I mean, the list goes on and on. Like they have very good, talented players that are playing for some of the best European clubs right now, but. They just got to get it together when they do. They have to perform at the highest stages and they just have to get used to that pressure because all eyes are going to be on this team because I think now um, it's gotten to the point where I think a lot of people kind of watch the U.S. men's national team to kind of see the disappointment, you know? I guess like they've been so used recently to the disappointment that they're just getting more and more used to it and it's now more of a joke of watching them instead of like actually watching them for hope. So, um <laughs> It's funny because it's the exact opposite of when you watch the U.S. women's national team because they always, they're like winning back-to-back World Cups, winning, you know, Olympic medals, like breaking, shattering like all national team records. And then you have the U.S. men's national team failing to qualify for everything. It's just funny. Mm -hmm. It's literally, I don't know, it's just maybe that American pride where we have to be number one at everything. Yeah. And then we see, you know, at least in athletics, you see the U.S. do so well. And all those other sports as well, like basketball, like it's literally like it's not. I mean, you know, U.S. versus the world, it's like pretty <laughs> close now. But like, literally, the U.S. as a team, it's like broken. It's like a cheat code. Yeah. And then you know, you look at other, literally, like as you said, the women's World Cup team is like they're number one. It's like you always just think of them being like the top players, mm-hmm. like the top of most other countries. And like the list goes on. You just keep going. It's just like it's always the U.S. wanting to be number one. Everything like swimming, you know, things like that. But for soccer, I feel like it's always on, you know, that it's always been a stereotype that soccer is always like not the number one. It's always like, oh, you put American football first. Oh, you put baseball first. Oh, you put basketball over soccer. Like soccer was never in like the top. Like, yeah. it's, you know, it's top five, but like it's not yeah. the top. You don't. Most people don't send their kid in to learn soccer. Yeah. Maybe I, they play think, as like a 10 year old. But like, I think never the like, problem oh, too is that. um there, there was this, uh, there's also been like articles and stuff written about this, but you know, youth sports in general is very expensive, but youth soccer sports is super expensive, especially if you want to be part of like a travel soccer team. Like I yeah. think there was a report, like Zlatan Ibrahimovic commented on it. He was just like, yeah, this is like way too expensive. And I think it was like something around like 18 K to send kids on like a youth soccer season. I'm like 18 K like that's, that's almost like, that's insane. And, um, I also think what also hurts the U.S. um, when it comes to other countries is that the lack of availability in terms of like playing soccer on like pitches and such. Like you can go to the park and play on a football field and stuff, but there's usually not goals set up and everything. Um, In other countries, you have like like basket instead of basketball courts, you have like the outdoor, I guess, outside soccer arenas or they're like the short little outside soccer four by fours type stuff. Um, and you, you may occasionally see that at least where we live in Georgia, you may occasionally see that every now and again, but it's not very, um, very abundant. And what you instead see is a bunch of baseball fields, a bunch of basketball courts, a bunch of football fields, but not a lot of soccer specific places where kids can go and play or even, um, adults and stuff. And I think the lack of access to that also hurts because it's like, dang, a kid, if he really wants to get into soccer, he's got to pay like chuck up like 18K and such to get into youth soccer and everything. That's actually like super relatable to me because like I grew up in an area that's like it's not it's it's not like, you know, in the slums. It's, it's kind of more, I would say, in general, a little bit more affluent. Mm-hmm. And even that majority of my life growing up, I had to play half my time on like baseball fields because yeah. like, oh, it's like, oh. The one soccer field we have in town is closed because of just, you know, turf management, regrowing the grass. Like exactly. Literally the local park near me has been closed. Like that field for the soccer has been closed for like five years because of just letting the grass regrow. I'm like, dude, it's it's not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> or it's like maybe like the main field with turf. They lock up the goals because they don't want the kids ripping up the yeah we even had that problem it's like when we went to a park to go play pickup soccer and we were like okay we see some goals let's get them and then we get like we get like there's a guy like a park ranger coming he was like hey next time you gotta like let us know if you're gonna do that i'm like why it's right there like who who's gonna steal a goal like that thing is heavy you know i mean i don't know you'd be surprised (laughs) but i mean even then and for the travel thing i actually asked my parents growing up when i was you know in high school and i was like 
I, I played rec my entire life and I kind of asked, I was like, so why did you never sign me up for travel or, or like select team when like I've seen some of my other friends that get put on those teams, like we we're kind of like same level, but then like eventually they just started going to travel teams and select teams when I just stayed on rec the whole time. Mm-hmm. And my mom was like, well, it costs like two grand and That's rec a lot. costs 140 yeah. for the season. Like rec was 140, always the same location. And like, we can't travel. Like we don't have the means to just drive you out to like some random city in Georgia and like have you play a game. But that's how you it's, get better when you play like other players in other regions that are a little bit better than you, mm-hmm. then you can improve. But I mean, like you said, 2K, that's a lot of money. Like a lot yeah, of people just don't have that much money to like fork up, you know? We're like, and then at that point I was like, oh, okay, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> I was like 2K, geez, as opposed to like 140. And then I played for like a church league basically. And <laughs> Like that was really the only few times you can really play on an actual pitch without being yelled at or having someone kick you off. So <laughs> that's the thing too. It's like, it's, it's ironic. Cause like, you know, there's, I don't want to like bring stereotypes or anything, but like there's other places that they don't have as many amenities in the town, but like they find a way to still play. Like you can set up like most of the time when I play soccer these days, it's like, all right, set up two bags on the floor or like, you know, get creative, find like a random set of sticks and then, make that into a three-dimensional goal, something like that. Even when we were at UGA, we, we used barricades <laughs> that uh, were the universities, but we just shaped them into a goal. And uh, I mean, it's just little creative things like that. And it's it makes it just that little bit harder. Yeah, there's always like, like friction. They're like yeah, stopping it's you. It's never easy. And, you know, other countries, other places in the US, they have to overcome a lot more, obviously. But like that, the fact that it's just a little bit harder to set up it's like you have to put in just that little bit of effort as opposed to like going to a baseball field. It's like, oh, there's always the four diamonds. Oh, there's always like yeah, there's always football. like millions of baseball fields, especially yeah, in the I'm south. Like, right, Any right. park you go in the south, there's always, <laughs> always empty. <laughs> they're, they're always. Yeah, they're always empty because no one's playing baseball, but there's always baseball fields. There's always a football field and there's always like at least like four or five hoops to play um, like basketball goals to play um, mm-hmm. hoops. But then there's like when you go to soccer, it's either you get like super teeny tiny goals you get no goals or you just have to like kick around in the football football field um exactly which is not even like wide enough really half the time so um that's that was probably that's been like the biggest thing that's been talked about since the 2018 world cup is in the u.s it's a pay-to-play model where Mm -hmm. it's if you have the means to pay the money then that means you can play but that when you do that that also means you segment and you um you kind of get rid of a lot of kids that can't afford the ability to pay for the um a uh, pay for the uh the equipment and then the amenities and all the needs but i think um some clubs and such have set up like scholarships for like academies and stuff so they can get like set up with like kids that can't necessarily afford the expenses but it definitely just needs to get better because it's ridiculous that it has to go through this many hurdles to get a kid to play soccer when in other countries you can just go to your local playground and it's just like boom you just start playing like street ball right there i mean on top of that too i just feel like the system we have for players to get good and like become professional, semi-professional, it's also just not there. Like when you think of Europe or even like South America, they have academies. They have, yeah. it's like, oh, you send your your kid out and then he's, he or she is just at this academy for like their entire lives. Yeah. They like, like do their studying play. and stuff there. Like they do like studies and not as much studious as I heard from one of my uh, old British friends that I met who was trying to get into the Watford Academy. Really? I met him just online on FIFA, just like an Xbox Live game chat. He was just talking trash and then we end up becoming friends for some reason. I thought they do but, like uh, some sort of like uh, like study work and stuff because they have to send you off there, you know, and like you kind of live yeah. there. It's it's weird because like they also have like in primary school, as they call it, or like our equivalent of like elementary and like middle school, like, you know, you can start to pick your paths. And like when you're in secondary school, like in high school, for us, uh, you can start to choose your path, your career path, what oh, you dang, want to do. And early. he chose sports and like he just wanted to play soccer. And I was like, dude, do you what about like studying for all the other things? It's like, no, nah, just, you know, just play. <laughs> so I was like, what? So, I mean, they have like a, almost a career. I mean, it's not a very safe career path because, like, you know, not everyone can become a professional player. Uh, Alex Hunter, like, the story. You yeah, Alex that. Hunter, like that kind of story. But <laughs> Even in the U.S., for at least for football, baseball, you know, you got junior colleges. You can go to there for you know on scholarships. You yeah, can go division to two, division division two, division three. Things I feel like, like there's that. more and like a path. 
And then yeah. for the MLS, it's really weird because, like, yeah, you can be part of the academy and sign on. Um, but there's always like I, MLS also has like really weird rules that limits players' that options, like availability to move and stuff like that. And um, it, I've also heard that if you um, go to college to play soccer, like Division One soccer, it's very hard to even make like MLS team and such. Like even from there, like you can get drafted and stuff like that, but um, like it's very, it's still very hard. Like going to college and going Division One soccer doesn't even guarantee you like a up spot on an MLS team, which is crazy as well. Because mm-hmm. usually in like all the other American sports, it's kind of like okay, if you do really well in Division One play, you can get a guaranteed spot on a professional team, but. For soccer, at least, I've just noticed that it just it just tends to be a lot tougher for people. Right. And I just feel like it's just such a big gap between like in the U.S. The equivalent of like the highest rank you can get in college sports is D1. Yeah. And then there's D2 and then D3 and then like junior college, if I'm correct on that. Mm-hmm. But for, you know, for American football, for example, you can go to like a UGA, you can go to Alabama or, you know, Clemson, and they're all like D1 schools. And then... If you're like a top star there, you're basically guaranteed to go to the NFL and be like at least a a continuous starter there, like constant starter or even sometimes a star. But like, have you heard of a D1 player for soccer? Can you even name one? (laughs) It's like, I don't know. I don't. I mean, like the only ones I can think of, the ones that have actually made it in the MLS, like I know like Julian, um, Julian Gressel, like he played a division one soccer at I can't remember which college. But I think he played there for a couple of years. And then there's like Jordan Morris, I think, because he went to Stanford. And then DeAndre Yedlin, because he went to Akron. And that's it. I don't know any other like other Division One soccer players that are currently playing right now or anything. Like, that's so sad. Like, I feel like that's why I'm thinking it's like it's just not as much infrastructure in the U.S. to like really develop these kind of players. Because like majority of those players that I know... They went to, you know, UGA played on the women's team. I went to, you know, some like Valdosta State and played there. Uh, like for the men's team, like D2, D3. Like they just said, oh, I just played it in, in college. And then after I graduated, you know, I just went on to my other career. That's pretty like, much now right. Now I'm like a consultant. Now I'm like a, a med student. Yeah. Things like that. They just kind of never do, like, see them like, oh, yeah, I continue playing soccer. Like they all just, it's like, no, oh, it's just, now it's just fitness. It was just <laughs> a part of my gig that I just grew up with. It's like, what? It's really weird. It's It's just... You know, I guess that's kind of like, I guess all we've been listing are like some of the systemic problems of U.S. soccer in this country that kind of lead into why we struggle in these big competitions. It's getting a little bit better, but I still think there's definitely a lot of structural problems that need to get fixed um, so that we can produce better soccer players and more consistently good soccer players for this country. So it's weird. It's as we mentioned, it's just a weird system how U.S. works in soccer. This is basically like our our rant of why we can't get into the Olympics or the World Cup. As Taylor Twoman says, what are we doing? What are, what are we doing? <laughs> Literally, what are we doing? Like, exactly. Oh my gosh. It makes no sense. I mean, we could go on and on, but um, we wanted to move on to, I guess, the preview section for this coming weekend in the Premier League. I guess circling back to the Premier League here. Um, we have some couple big games, but to start it off, we have Leicester City versus Manchester City. It will be an interesting one because all these teams are obviously coming back from international break, how the players react and such. But I think uh, Pep Guardiola, given the international break, I think he'll have his team ready. I think uh, I think Manchester City beat Leicester City 2-1 in this matchup. I don't think Brendan Rodgers has a chance. Brendan Rodgers is facing what we call in layman terms is injury crisis yeah. like it's literally just you know i almost said a bad word but like <laughs> it's like it's um it, anyways but you know, man city, oh, yeah the infirmary but anyways <laughs> man city <laughs> you know they're on a they had their winning streak snapped recently but you know with this aguero information this kind of retirement this is now like the I guess kind of swan song road to the end, whatever the term is, like it's just the final countdown. Final and, countdown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And having this be like his last few games for the rest of the yeah, season. They're definitely going to show out for him. Right. And hopefully he plays. Yeah. Hopefully he starts and gets a goal or something. But I think Man City got it. I think also it will be 
actually, I'm going to say 2 0 because Man City's defense this season has been insane. Yeah. And Ederson actually is the Golden Glove nominee, or not nominee, but the lead for that race. Yeah. So, Dang. I wouldn't be surprised if it's 2 0 for Man City. Yeah. Uh, we both got City wins. I think City will comfortably win too. They might leak a goal like late on, but. I'm just going to go 2 1 there. But then we have Manchester United, Brighton. Kind of a weird one to pick out, but United, um, it was oddly enough, after we got done recording the, our previous episode, episode 110, um, they played, Manchester United played Leicester City in the FA Cup, and Leicester City won 3 1, and United's FA Cup run just came to a crushing end. Um, so it was very unfortunate. They're like going, they went into the, um, the international break with a loss, and they're playing a Brighton team that has gotten very unlucky. I would say they should have probably won a lot more games, picked up a lot more points, but they've just gotten very unlucky with hitting the crossbar, hitting the post, not converting their chances and just getting hit on the counterattack. Manchester United are at home. I think with the international break, gave the players a bit of a recharge, a bit of a refresher. So I think they can win this game, but they're going to have to be locked in because they have a really bad habit of not being locked in and doing really stupid things for like the first 45 minutes. But if they can avoid that, I think they can win this game uh, 2-0. Hmm. If not, Wait. I think it's 2-1 because knowing them, they might do something really stupid for the first 35 minutes. Martial Hurt? He limped off in the French um, for the for a French national team match, but from all the from the reports I've been seeing, it, it wasn't like too bad. It wasn't like a serious injury, so he might be still good to go. All right. I will say that... And you just mentioned the very beginning of the podcast. I was I was on like a week long kind of vacation myself, but like you know, obviously social distancing, <laughs> and I was traveling by car. But for this, I I can for sure say taking a taking a rest is a big yeah. leap, and definitely that this, will be a big thing for these players yeah. because I would say you know, although it was an international break, a lot of the Man U players still played. They still play for their international teams. They still played for, you know, like, you know, we got Harry Maguire out there playing <laughs> for England. For England today. Exactly. So it's just like, mm, did he really get a break? Well, yeah. meanwhile, not, you know, all respect to Brighton, but I'd say majority of their team <laughs> usually does not make international teams. <laughs> maybe for like some random, like, you know, smaller country of like maybe not as competitive of starting 11s, but I'd say majority of the Brighton team was actually rested. And they're still in that relegation fight while Man U are just trying to see how far they can stay in second place. Yeah. So the motivations going into this game is a lot different. And I'm not going to lie. I think coming back from break and having this rest for the Brighton side while Man U kind of had like a pseudo rest for majority of players, I think Brian could sneak a 1-1. No. I don't want that energy. <laughs> they need the points to secure top four because Chelsea are like right up behind um, United and Leicester. Dang. Playing the psychological game right now. It's Dang. all about the mental state. I see that. <laughs> I, I, I see how that... Um, I can definitely see that result. I definitely am not bringing that energy in. I need to, I need United to get a win, so I'm predicting a 2-1 win, but you got a 1-1 a draw. So hopefully that's not the case, but we shall see. Um, but moving on to the final and biggest game of the weekend is Arsenal versus Liverpool. Um, two mega clubs. Usually whenever these two teams face off, it's like goals galore. Um, I do remember that one game where it was 3-3 three, three or something like that in mm-hmm. the first half or something like that. It, it was in... Or second st- half. Yeah. It, or yeah. was it when like Ozil took the lead and like it was like pandemonium at, at the Emirates. It was like 3-2 at the time. Arsenal took the I, lead. I, I and think then- Liverpool was 3-1 up and then they tied it. Or Arsenal tied it 3-3 three, three within like six minutes in the second mm-hmm. half. Bad. I was like, all right, well, <laughs> those are that. Just, okay. It, it, like this, this matchup has always been like a classic of just filled with goals and highlights. I remember that one season when Salah um, had that infamous where he was just running by himself. Like the camera couldn't even catch up to him because he was so fast. Like it was just literally him on a breakaway for Liverpool. Um, it was just versus, in. Yeah. And he just yeah. smoked him. Um, but this game has always been really fun. But because of that and because of how leaky both defenses have been, I would say, for the whole season. I'm going to go... Um, I'm actually... I'm going to go 3-2, but I think Liverpool will win this game, but I, I'm going to say it's a goal fest, so I'm going to go 3-2. Holy cow. I am not 
confident going into this game <laughs> after seeing Arsenal kind of go to town on Tottenham in that North London derby. Like I saw that Arsenal team and I was like, holy cow, they're playing on times two speed and Liverpool are still trying to cope with Kabak and Nathaniel Phillips at center back. Granted, they got three clean sheets with three starts together. So Mm -hmm. that's some good juju, but I don't know against this Arsenal side. It's going to be a little harder. And also, you know, Diogo Jota coming back. He has been really helpful. Like yeah. it's for sure a much needed catalyst to get some goals, but I really think it's really going to be on him. And I think, you know, Liverpool could get one goal from him, but I don't think he's going to score more than one. Dang. I, I think the other two, Salah and Mane, are still kind of in a slump. I mean, Salah is one of the top goal scorers in the league, but ironically enough, there's still like a rough season for him. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't, I can't see him scoring either. But this Arsenal side, they're going to be playing into Liverpool's strengths, which is playing fast. And Liverpool love to play fast. They like to have a fast game. And this would be their bread and butter. But just right now, this is not the same Liverpool side, at least in the Premier League. Mm-hmm. In the Champions League, when they face Real Madrid, it's going to be a different story. But <laughs> in the Premier League, it's like, all right, well, back to uh, struggling. And I'm not going to lie. I think Arsenal are going to win. Dang. 3-1. Oh, wow. 3-1. Actually, no, no, no. Wait. With this defense, they actually need to know. Okay. I'm going to say 2-1. Okay, 2-1. Um, Tank, so you're going Liverpool defeat. I I think they're yeah. going to win 3-2, but you're going 2-1. Um, But whatever we picked, I guess, result, we're hoping that at least it's a goal fest because that's the, that's the type of scoreline we're kind of predicting here. I'm hoping it kind of lives up to the uh, to the excitement that it normally does. Um, That's me praying. Hope- but hopefully I jinx it and it's a nil nil. So that was, we get a point, but <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a two, two or one, one, like an exciting draw at least. Like yeah. Yeah. Stuff. Um, but dang, better than nothing. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see what, we'll see what happens in this game. I'm, I'm excited to see how this matchup plays out. Um, but he's going two one arsenal. I'm going three, two Liverpool for the win. But as we always say that, uh, that kind of wraps up episode one eleven. Um, as we always say, please make sure to, rate comment subscribe you can subscribe to us on apple Podcasts and also give leave us a rating on there if you'd like um, but as we always say just giving us a listen is more than enough and if you want to share this podcast with one of your friends or anyone that is interested in soccer that's also really great and really appreciated um, you can also subscribe to us um, on youtube at the premiere pod where you can find the video versions of this podcast um, and you can also follow us on twitter and instagram at the premiere pod you can leave us questions um, questions comments or anything of that nature and we'll definitely get back to you and respond to you um, social handles the premiere pod on instagram and twitter but yeah that kind of wraps up season three episode 111 for us thank you guys so much for listening and watching if you're watching the youtube video uh thank you guys peace